Welcome to Second Request, where we explore solutions to monopoly problems. I'm your host, Teddy Downey, and we've got a special guest today, Phil Spencer, CEO of Microsoft's Xbox, to talk about the future of competition in the video game market and Microsoft's pending deal for Activision. Phil, thanks so much for uh, sitting down and doing this today. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully it's a good discussion. Yeah, and you know, obviously the elf in the room, you have a major merger right now pending, uh, Microsoft's acquisition of Activision. And I know you think the regulators are, are giving the deal a bad rap, and I wanted to kick things off with you telling us why you think it's a good deal. Yeah, from the, the beginning of me being in this role, thinking about how we're gonna grow Xbox, um, what our role is in gaming, we've tried to put the gamer at the center of our decisions decisions around business models we're focusing on, games that we're gonna go build, where those games are available. And when I think about this deal and the impact on our customers and gamers in general, I think they're gonna have access to more games through more business models on more devices than they've ever been able to play on. So for me, I, I think it, it puts the gamer at the center. It allows them to play great games on the devices that they wanna play on. And to me, it feels like that the regulators looking out for the what's best for consumers, um, that this this deal is in the best interest of, of gamers. And I just have a, a couple of things that I know the regulators are, are looking at that I wanted to talk about. Microsoft has already said it's not going to withhold Call of Duty from Sony, but you are making some ZeniMax games exclusive. So. Why shouldn't regulators be worried about Microsoft making Call of Duty exclusive down the road? It is true that in the console business, exclusives are part of the history of how people sell consoles. Sony has great exclusive games, Nintendo has great exclusive games, and Microsoft does. When we think about large franchises like Minecraft, Call of Duty, where they have established player bases on other platforms, how we grow and nurture those franchises, meet the players that are currently playing those games and expecting the next version of those games and grow those franchises. Pulling a game like Call of Duty off of the largest console platform is totally at odds with all of that. And if you go back to the ZeniMax titles, all of the ZeniMax games that we've said we're gonna ship on PlayStation, we have shipped on PlayStation. All of the games that we acquired ZeniMax were available on PlayStation at the time of, that we acquired them. We have continued to do content updates on PlayStation and PC. So when you think about Elder Scrolls Online, Fallout 76, there's not a single game that we've had at ZeniMax that we've pulled from PlayStation. We've continued to update every game that's available on PlayStation, keeping them in sync. In fact, the first two games we shipped from ZeniMax were actually PlayStation 5 exclusive games, not Xbox exclusive games. And those are just contractual commitments between Sony. Sony signed a deal to exclude those games from Xbox and we lived up to the commitment that ZeniMax had made prior to us acquiring. So, you know, we're, we haven't pulled any games from Sony. In fact, we've expanded our footprint of games that we've shipped on Sony's PlayStation since our closing of ZeniMax and the same thing since our closing of uh, Minecraft which is much earlier, but um, as we've extended that franchise. And I'd love to talk a little bit about the these different markets for video games. You've got people playing on consoles, PCs, phones, as you talk about a lot. This merger is about mobile and then even TVs now. Are each of these distinct markets, you know, I'd love to get your perspective on that. I mean, on consoles, you've got Microsoft, Sony and Nintendo. Phones, you've got Apple and Google. You know, PCs, Microsoft, Apple. How are these different markets and what's the outlook for them? If you look at the largest games on the planet, those games tend to be available on multiple platforms. So we, we happen to own Minecraft. If you look at a game like Roblox or you look at a game like Fortnite, if you look at games like that, you find games, Genshin Impact would be another example, that creators want to meet their customers on the devices that their customers want to play on. And it was a pivot for us years ago with our Xbox strategy of it's not about trying to get everybody to buy our device and for our device to be the only place that people can play. Every game that we ship on Xbox, 
We also ship on PC and it's available in our subscription and, and our cloud the day it launches. If somebody wants to play on their television using our console, we think we love that experience. But if somebody has a, an Android tablet and that's the way that they want to play, if you have a web browser and you pay the subscription, our games are available there. You definitely on the platform side have a lot of closed platforms that are trying to protect their size and keep that closed nature of their platform. But from a creator perspective and a player perspective, there are 3 billion people who play video games and people play games on the devices that are in their hand. I play mobile games, I play PC games, I play console games, and it's great when I can play the same game across all those devices and play with my same community. So definitely if you're Apple or Google in the mobile space, you want to keep those platforms closed. There's only one storefront. There's only one way to really find new content on those devices. If you're in the console space and you're leading to the extent that Sony is relative to us, you want to keep a closed platform where they don't have to deal with other people and other creators kind of creating engagement on their platform without their control. But I don't think that's in the best interest of creators or players. And I'd like to stay on phone, the phone market for a little bit because it's a, a duopoly market in the sense that you only have Google and Apple. You've got an audience with these antitrust enforcers right now. What's the right solution for them to deal with Google and Apple uh, when it comes to phone operating systems to create a better competitive market for games on phones? You know, I look at how Windows has evolved and Windows is a large scale platform, over a billion users, and anybody can create a storefront on a Windows PC. If you're a creator and you want to go directly to your customer, you're able to create a single storefront that might just carry your own content and sell that directly and you do all of the closing and carrying costs and cogs. If you want to use a third party store such as Valve Steam, um, the Epic Games Store, you're able to go and use those. And you can do the, you can do both. You can have your own store that goes directly to customers. You could have third party stores, a multitude of third party stores that can compete on price and service and, and features. And obviously there's also a Windows store. There's a store built into the Windows operating system. So it's not to preclude first party platform holders from building a store, but it shouldn't be to the exclusion of anybody else creating a storefront. And I watch how Windows has evolved when you have large publishers like Riot who are, go directly to their customers. They own a game called League of Legends and they're able to do most of their business on the PC directly with their customers through their own store. Um, and you see the rise of things like Valve Steam, which is a massive storefront for third parties. And you have smaller storefronts that might service a specific part of the market. I think that open storefront capability on a device at the scale of mobile would be critically, critically important to opening up diversity of competition around service costs and discovery on the world's largest gaming platform, which are, are the mobile phones in the world. Are, are there going to be those kinds of open markets, uh, you know, other alternative ways of buying on, on consoles ever, do you think? I think so. The challenge with consoles today is the business model around console is selling a device at loss and making it up through store revenue and other um, revenue. And I think we'd have to, there would be a change to that model, but I don't necessarily think that's bad. And as we look forward, um, we think about open access to these devices. Um, for, for different storefronts. Now there's a much different scale between mobile and consoles, but I think the question about consoles is a valid question, but there's what, like 1.8 billion players on phones in the world. And there's about 200 million people that play on console. So console, I, I think just in terms of the impact on the industry is, is, is much different. Um, but I think you'll see business model diversity on devices that you play on that could allow for multiple ways for publishers to get content to their customers. And, you know, we've talked about the, the different types of platforms. Uh, I'd like to get into the different types of, of games that are out there and the kind of different markets there. You know, obviously one is where you buy the game and, you know, it, it's like a triple A game and you, you buy it for 50 or $70 and, and you can enjoy it forever. You don't, you don't really need to be online to, to play it. You just buy yourself playing the game. No subscription needed. Another is where you pay a subscription, pay online, and new con you, you get new content. And then there's games that are, you know, sort of this other category, the free-to-play 
they can be pretty addictive and they have all these in-app purchases. And, you know, to me, those games actually seem to have a lot of policy issues, issues associated with them, whether it's data collection, addicting people, or just generally kind of having an unseemly or, you know, sort of predatory business model. And, you know, personally, I have a big, strong preference, you know, grew up in the 80s and 90s for, for AAA games, even if they are more expensive, where I can play it and enjoy it, but, but you know, still, still spend some time with my family. I'm really curious to get your thoughts on, on the outlook for these different markets. You know, some people will say, hey, we're, it's just going to be free to play. That's where all the money is made. And uh, that, that sort of seems suboptimal to me. Uh, I'd love to get your take on uh, how you see things playing out in those different types of games. Well, I agree with you that the diversity in business models that creators can use to build games is something that as an industry, we should embrace and defend. Just like if you think about video entertainment, the business model on television is like broadcast television is different than it is on a subscription is different than it is when I go to the movies. And the fact that all of those exist, I think is a good thing on the creative side because you have creators who have a, a specific point of view in terms of what they're trying to deliver. And as a consumer, I feel like if I want to go to a two hour movie at the cinema, I can go do that. If I, I want, want to subscribe to Netflix or Disney Plus, or I can do that in my house. And if I want to sit there and watch YouTube or, or NBC, I, I can do that. The business model supports kind of the way I want to engage in the content and frankly, the, the creators who build this different content. I don't want one business model to become dominant in gaming. I think we, we've seen in certain markets, you know, music, I think is, it, it's been interesting to watch the evolution of the music market. And I, I want gaming to be viable in multiple business models. It's why we, we created Game Pass originally. One of the reasons was you saw a lot of games, large games going free to play because of the top of funnel, just the ability to attract somebody when there's no upfront cost, zero friction to getting to attracting a new customer is pretty appealing. And if the only other option is a $70 retail game, that's such a huge gap for many people on the planet that I either spend $70 on a game and there are games that are less expensive than that. But if you just, you know, your AAA games or I have to play a free to play games, we thought there's an opportunity here to create a, a tier in the middle. Um, our case on console was $10 a month using US pricing and say, we're going to put our big AAA games in there on the day that they launch. And for customers who want to use the subscription as a way to build their library, it's their choice. We don't put games exclusively in the subscription. So when people try to compare it to like a Netflix or something, I, I cringe a little bit because every game that's available in our subscription is also available to buy. Um, and you as a player, you get to make the decision about how you want to go play, the, um, build your library of games. And I want to make sure, I think free to play has a role and there's certain creative um, opportunities that are there for game builders that are really only possible in free to play. But I don't think the only other option can be $70 retail games. I, I think having a multitude of business models and price points in the middle, especially when you think about the global players out there and, and different financial economic situations that different players are in um, is a healthy thing for our industry. And I also say what, what you said in terms of the predatory business models and the actions within games, that's something that as an industry um, we have to stay on top of and we, we work with regulators when they have questions about those different business models um, because we want gaming to continue to grow and be a healthy place for everybody to play and there's always learning for us. Yeah, I, certainly as a parent, some of those like uh, some of those predatory business models uh, are a little disconcerting. So I appreciate uh, anything to sort of uh, get rid of the, the more pernicious uh, little segment there. Well, let me and this this will have nothing to do with with the, at least the regulatory topic. But it's one of the reasons we think parental controls are so important. So as soon as you say you're a parent, I can't help myself. My like my knee jerk reaction is please go set up parental controls if they're playing on Xbox. And that lets you control whether your your family can buy, who can play with them online. All of those controls can be set up on the phone. You don't actually have to go onto a console if, if, if that's not where a parent wants to manage um, what their, their child or the family gets access to. Um, but I always encourage, especially when people have kids um, and they're playing online, the first thing they should do is, regardless of what platform they're on, 
is set up a, a parental account because it's it, it's it's no different when you when your kid's playing than sending with your credit card to the mall if you're not there like their ability to go buy things and you want to lock that down as a parent to ensure you know who your child's playing with what they have access to and even how many hours um, a week they can play all of that is controllable and i always encourage people to set it up yeah no i appreciate that i only have a three and a one-year-old so i'm not worried i'm not worried about it quite <laughs> yet but soon enough I, I, they'll be able to buy stuff on it on my phone i think yeah so uh we, you mentioned pricing there for a second and uh you know this is another you know inflation is the talk of the town in dc right now and uh there's some reports microsoft has just followed sony in increasing first party video game prices I know you've said in the past you wanted to keep prices low during tough times for consumers. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, just what changed on that front? Was it, is it supply chain costs? And also, you know, from a regulatory perspective, does a price increase right now hurt an argument that Microsoft is kind of a positive disruptive force in, in the market or is going to be post-merger? Yeah, you know, pricing is always something that we're, we're conscious of and the impact it has on our customers and we there's multiple prices of, of things that we can price in our, our, our platform there's obviously the price of the consoles themselves um, the price of the games the price of the subscription and just given our economic realities right now something had to give in terms of us continuing to run the business with the increased cost basis that we had and the thing we decided to announce today, we haven't raised any prices today because we just wanted to give consumers a heads up on what's to come in the next year, is that for our largest AAA games, that the retail pricing would go from $60 to $70 in US pricing. And like you said, we're no, in no way the first mover in this. In fact, other publishers, other platforms um, have already announced this and made that move. Um, we had not, we had held off as long as we could and we, we still like the fact that our subscription is at the price it's at. Our console with our Series S is the lowest price current gen console in the market. In managing the business, the, the move we decided to make, would make was on the retail pricing of our largest games. And it's really just the, the cost basis of building those games and ensuring we can run the business um, in the right way for our customers. And I, I want to talk a little bit also about mobile because you, that, you, that comes up over and over again as, as sort of important to you and important to Microsoft. And I'm curious, is that because that's just a bigger market or do you see some sort of inevitability about games going in that direction? Um, uh, you know, I'm curious about why this merger is so much about mobile in your in your eyes. Yeah, we, we look at the largest gaming companies on the planet. The largest gaming company is Tencent. Um, and Tencent is, uh, has a strong mobile presence and you see mobile is the largest category of gaming out there. If you, three billion people play video games, mobile phones are the most prolific consumer electronic device on the planet that plays games. Um, and in many places, you're gonna have to reach customers on the device that's already in their pocket. Most, most families on the planet won't go out and spend specific money to buy a bespoke gaming device. So when you think about the world's largest franchises and a, those will exist on mobile. They're gonna to have to over time. You're gonna to have to find some way of allowing the players of the planet to go play those games, just like you've seen in music and in video where you know if all of the services are available on, on the devices that people wanna play on. Um, mobile is the largest segment of gaming. It's the fastest growing segment of gaming and the largest franchises more and more that people are playing are available on phone. Not necessarily on phone exclusively, um, but they're available on phone. So when we think about being a platform for creators, and if somebody says, hey, I'm gonna go build a game on Xbox, we wanna make sure that we can offer to that creator the largest set of players possible for their game. Some of that is through the business model we talked about of ensuring that we've got different flexible business models for customers so that they can get to the right piece of content in the right way that makes a financial sense for the creator. Distribution is another way. How do we distribute the games to different devices and what's the kind of technology mechanism behind that? And then when we think about mobile, we're going to have to find a way to allow people who are creating Xbox games to see that players with mobile phones on the planet are part of the audience that they can reach. 
So for us, when we, when we look at what we're capable of today and where people engage with Xbox, most people who engage with Xbox engage on console. We have a growing kind of uh, presence on our Windows that's growing and we're investing there and Game Pass, our subscription is available there. But the place where we're completely irrelevant is on the largest platform, mobile. So when we looked at the opportunities out there, we said, well, we're not going to be able to create a platform component because the two platform holders, the duopoly, as you said, won't allow us to go put an Xbox with Game Pass and everything that's there on those devices. Um, they literally block it. So the only other option for us today is to find content that players on mobile phones love that they will go play um, so that we can start to build a foothold with players on mobile that then we can look to increase discoverability and, and business model and, and distribution for games through the engagement that we have on mobile devices, on mobile phones. And that's really what led to, to this, looking at Activision Blizzard King, was the strength that they have built with King, uh, with Call of Duty Mobile, with Diablo Mobile, which is growing, Drop Diablo Immortal, um, which is growing. Um, they've done a really good job finding most, uh, more and more customers on mobile, which made it a, an attractive partnership for us. And, you know, I think probably, I mean, clearly the biggest problem that the regulators have with this deal is, is related to Call of Duty's you know, sort of must have almost, uh, it's like a must have game on, on, the, on consoles. And if the deal is really about mobile, is there anything you can do to, you know, tell the regulators, hey, this deal is more about, is really, really is about mobile? Like, why not just divest Call of Duty? I know you mentioned Call of Duty mobile, but like, it just seems like there's a disconnect between like, hey, this is really about mobile and the regulators really focused on, um, on consoles and like, what can Microsoft do to hammer that home? There's really only been one major opposer to the deal and it's Sony and Sony's trying to protect their dominance on console and the way they grow is by making Xbox smaller they have a, a very different view of the industry than we do they, they don't ship their games day and date on PC they don't put their games in the subscription when they they launch their games um, they're starting to think about mobile as I see from the outside just kind of reading some of the moves that they're doing um, but because Sony's leading all of the dialogue around why this deal shouldn't go through to protect their dominant position in console, the thing that they grab onto is, is Call of Duty. And we've said over and over, we'll make a multi-year, 10-year commitment to PlayStation. It was the first call Satya and I made to ship Call of Duty on PlayStation. Satya and I, Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, we made a call to the CEO of Sony the day that the deal was announced to say that it's our intent to keep Call of Duty on PlayStation. And they actually publicly affirmed that at the time. And now we're kind of getting in the slow roll on the negotiation because it's, it's, it's become good fodder for the regulators to discuss this. If you just look at the deal model itself, I mean, it's not hard to think about how much of the valuation of this company is Call of Duty revenue that happens on PlayStation and to pay what we're paying for the overall Activision Blizzard King and then instantly impair the asset by saying, we're gonna pull the largest console version of Call of Duty out of the business model of this company, literally would, would take billions and billions that we would have to write off almost instantly because we would impair what Activision is. We've made the statements to Sony that we will continue to ship Call of Duty on PlayStation. Um, we've tried to make a 10 year commitment, same version, same features. We've said the same thing to, to regulators. I haven't really heard a customer opposition of how a consumer who's gonna get more choice through this acquisition of what the harm is. But the hard harm to the largest console maker seems to be where the regulators are spending a lot of time. And I mean, they're, they're, they're really twice as big as we are in the console market. So it's, I, I, it, I find it challenging because the, the largest console maker in the world is raising a, an objection about one franchise that we've said we will continue to ship on the platform. And it, it's a deal that benefits customers through choice and access. And Call of Duty is an important part of it. Like you said, Call of Duty Mobile is part of the Call of Duty um, franchise itself. How to decouple that from what happens on other platforms seems really, really challenging. 
um, when PlayStation players are going to get the same great Call of Duty experience they had this year, they would get the same thing next year and the year forward um, if this deal closes. Yeah, well, you know, that's, that, that's, I think everyone, that's something everyone's really interested. I'll, I'll, I, I just have one, one last question here and then I'll let you go. Um, when, you know, some people say, oh, the console mem- the market is dying. It's not going to be around that much longer. Um, but you seem really committed to all these different types of choice. And I'm just curious, like specifically to like the AAA games and, 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 the, and the console market, how do you see that? uh playing out in the future is that still going to be around are we still going to have that uh, it, you know uh may, maybe i'm asking this a little bit selfishly because that's how <laughs> that's how i play video games but uh i've got, I've got you here i got you here's my last my last question like please tell me that there will still be consoles no uh, but i'd love to just get your your take on like what's this market going to look like are we still going to have good competition there yeah i i think we will i mean it's if I think about you know any other media that has reached my house through different mechan video, music, whatever, like the number of devices around my house that I now listen to Spotify on is way more than what I had like one record player. Um, but I actually still have a record player and, and I love that. And I, I think consoles plugged into television that allow people to create great, amazing AAA games that I love to play, sounds like you love to play, I think that's a very viable part of the business. Now, it's not the fastest growing part of the business. So when I'm sitting running Xbox and I'm looking everywhere that gaming is growing, you hear me talk about mobile, you'll hear me talk about free to play and other kinds of content, but I don't want to miss the core. Like there are a ton of people who, and myself included, that love the the kind of big epic experiences of a single player retail game that I just go buy and I want to own it and I can go play by myself and kind of immerse myself in the experience. I hope Starfield coming out this year from us is is one of those to plug our own game. But just like we're going to continue to invest in those kind of games. We want to have the great devices, whether it's high-end gaming PCs, great consoles to go play on. And I think that's a market that will thrive for a long time. I think you'll end up with more devices in your house to play games. Just like I I have more Bluetooth speakers and headphones and other things now to listen to music or watching, you know, TV on my uh, on a on a tablet somewhere in my house. But that doesn't mean that that experience of sitting on the couch with a controller in my hand, probably jaw slightly ajar, (laughs) as I'm just, um, you know, diving into the to the next God of War game or Spider Man game or Starfield game. I want that to be around forever. I love that part of what our industry does, like the storytelling and the immersion. It's just awesome. All right, Phil. What, so what's your favorite video game right now? <laughs> right now, I could not stop playing Vampire Survivors. And if you haven't played that game, it is the most awesome game in the world right now. And I've never even heard of it. Dude, you've got to go play Vampire Survivors. <laughs> I'm not like... And, and then I will apologize in advance because like you, you won't shave for a week. But... It's very old school, top down. It's on PC. I think it's like five bucks on Steam. It's in Game Pass if you want to play it there um, on PC and console. Vampire Survivors, written by one guy. Just an awesome, awesome game. Thank you so, so much for doing this today. It was really a pleasure chatting with you. No, I appreciate it as well. It was uh, nice to get the opportunity to talk. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Second Request. Second Request is powered by the Capital Forum. For more information, connect with us at thecapitalforum.com or follow us on Twitter at capital underscore forum.